Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a senior librarian and a woman interested in working at the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Um, I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um, what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down, but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects. Right. But I don't know if I have the right skills. Well, we do provide training. Oh. We always include an orientation to the library, together with emergency procedures. That's fire regulations, emergency exits, first aid so you can cope with accidents or sudden illness. Things like that which are necessary for anyone who's working with the public. Then we give specialist training for particular projects, like using our database system. I do have quite good computer skills, in fact. Oh, great. Is there any sort of uh, dress requirement? Well, all staff have to wear a name badge, so they can be identified if they go outside the staff-only areas. But apart from that, there aren't many regulations. We ask you to sign in and sign out for insurance purposes, but that's all. How about transport? Do you live locally? Well, not too far away. I'm at Pauper's Beach. My husband needs a car during the day, but it's only about 20 minutes on the bus. In fact, we can reimburse part of your travel expenses in that case. Oh! Would that be the same if I came by car? No, uh, because parking is such a problem here. One thing we are looking for, though, is someone who can drive a minibus. No problem. So, do the projects involve going outside the library? Some, yes, but not all. We've just finished one which involved working with photographs taken of the area 50 or 100 years ago. It basically involved what we call encapsulation. Putting them in some sort of covers to keep them safe? Exactly. <laughs> it's time-consuming work and we were very grateful to have help with it. Then, sometime next year, we're hoping to begin working on an initiative involving the sorting and labelling of objects relating to local history. We'll be needing help with the cataloguing. Well, I'd definitely be interested. How about at present? Well, we have a small team who work to support those who are unable to read. Working with the blind? Yes, or other groups who have reading difficulties. We provide volunteers with equipment so that they can take books home with them and read them aloud onto CDs. We're gradually building up a collection that can be lent to those who need them. Hmm, I can see it would be useful, but I'd really like to do some sort of work where I can get the chance to meet people. How about reading stories to children? Mm, that's done by our regular staff. But we do have another project... It's a very long-established scheme which involves helping those who are unable to have direct access to the library. Oh, I noticed someone with a trolley of books when I was at the hospital last week. That sort of thing. That would have been one of ours, yes. It's one of our most popular services. Lots of people who wouldn't dream of going to the library normally or when they're at home borrow a book when the trolley comes round the ward. I can imagine. <laughs> Yes, I'd definitely be interested in that. Right, so how do I enrol? Well, we do ask all volunteers to commit themselves to a regular period each week. I could probably do five or six hours. Oh, be careful not to take on too much. But we do need someone for a couple of afternoons from two to four. So four hours altogether. That sounds fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation...
Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Right, so here's the application form. It asks the usual questions, name and address and telephone number. You also need to fill in details of who we should get in touch with in case of any accident or problem like that. Uh, we do need to have that filled in. And there's a space for date of birth, but that's only if you're over 75, so uh, we won't worry about that. No. <laughs> oh, it asks for qualifications. Do I need to provide certificates? They're not necessary. We'll need the names of two referees, not relatives or family members, obviously. Uh, what else? Signature of parent or guardian. <laughs> that won't be necessary, as I assume you're over 18. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's this? It says civil conviction check. That's a document we have to provide by law for those working on projects involving children, so we won't need it in your case. But you will need to sign this separate document. That's a, a copy of commitment. It's basically an agreement to work according to the library guidelines. So, if you'd like to fill this all in, you can do it here or take it home, whichever you prefer. I'll take it home if that's OK. Right, well, thank you for your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk on ginseng. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good morning. Today we'd like to talk with Mr. Schumacher of Kaiser Farms. Mr. Schumacher, what is in ginseng that makes it so special? Thanks. The key elements in ginseng are the active ingredients known as ginseng osides. All true ginseng products on the market contain a certain percentage of ginsenocides and a number of factors determine how much. The age of Wisconsin ginseng when harvested plays a major role in determining the natural level of ginsenocides. Tests have shown that the older the plant, the higher the ginsenoside content. Five-year-old Wisconsin ginseng plants have had ginsenoside levels as high as 20%. As a family operation, one of our strategies in producing the highest quality product available is to only harvest four- and five-year-old roots. The majority of Wisconsin ginseng harvested is three years old. The reason for this is that the expenses to care for and the possibility of disease increase as the plants become older. By limiting the amount of ginseng that we plant each year, we are able to provide the necessary attention and care to produce the highest quality four- and five-year-old roots. Now look at questions 15 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 15 to 20. What is Wisconsin ginseng used for? There are two real species of ginseng on the market today, Panax, Korean or Chinese, and Panax, 
Quinquefolius, Wisconsin. Since ginseng has been used for thousands of years in China, it is easiest to explain the differences in ginseng by using traditional Chinese herbal philosophy. Wisconsin ginseng is considered a cooling type herb, and Korean or Chinese ginseng are considered heating type herbs. As a cooling herb, Wisconsin ginseng is used as a preventative medicine. Here in the United States, Wisconsin ginseng is considered an adaptogen. As an adaptogen, Wisconsin ginseng acts to normalize body functions and strengthen the immune system and other systems in the body. Over a longer period of time, it builds up energy and maintains the body at a higher level, acting to reduce stress and fatigue. As a heating herb, Panax ginseng is used more as a stimulant and is often prescribed in China when the body is recovering from an illness and is worn down and in need of a rapid boost of energy. It is only recommended to be taken over short periods of time and not continuously. Wisconsin ginseng is considered the premier ginseng in China because it can be taken on a continuous basis and acts as a preventative type medicine by slowly building up the body. Wisconsin ginseng fits in perfectly with the Chinese herbal philosophy of preventative type medicine. Unlike here in the US, where we often wait until we are ill to seek medical attention, the traditional Chinese medicinal philosophy concentrates on building up the body to prevent illness. Based on the way Wisconsin ginseng has been prescribed in China, it is the correct ginseng to be taken for the majority of the consumers. Travel to China and see firsthand the ginseng that is considered the world's finest ginseng. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a student, Aldo, and his supervisor, Dr. Hurst, about his research assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. So, Aldo, how's it going so far with your assignment? Not too bad. You're looking at the community round here. That's right. How people perceive the community they are in. Have you made much progress? Hmm. I conducted quite a lot of interviews on the street with local residents. Their responses are interesting. I haven't got quite as many yet as I'd like. I had wondered if I'd have language problems, particularly with the different accents. I seem to have managed, though. Having to work in the open has made it harder, and with the cold weather there's been recently, people don't necessarily want to stop and talk like they do if it's nice and sunny. That's something I've had to deal with. Of course, some people are too busy to stop and talk, but that's OK. I see. So, have you formed a good overall picture of how people view the community? To an extent. I've certainly talked to plenty of older people. I guess they may have more time to talk. I still don't really have enough young mothers, though. I've managed to get enough older mothers and children through the schools. That's something I had been worried about. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Now, how are you going to deal with all the data you've collected? That's the difficult part. I guess I need to run some analyses, but I'm rather unclear about what methods to use. You've told me you're confident about using computers, so 
You just need some input on choosing programs. You should attend a statistics seminar. They're held every Friday after the methodology seminars in room 105. That should help you to select an approach. Oh, good. I'll do that. Now you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Meanwhile, let's hear something about what you've learned. Yes, I talked to a number of residents. Good. I imagine they didn't always have the same opinions. Views were certainly quite mixed. Take sports facilities. In general, people seemed to think they weren't very good. There's no swimming pool in the area, for example. But at the same time, there's a new football training area. It looks very smart to me, but it doesn't seem to get used very much. People seem to prefer sitting around in the parks. They enjoy that, taking picnics and so on. Although they want the council to be more efficient at cleaning, there's a lot of litter. People are obviously very concerned about their children's learning. The general view seems to be that early schooling at primary level is of a good standard in the area, but that this standard declines as children move up through the system. The colleges were criticised in particular. OK, now are you going to collect any more data? Some, I hope. There's a local festival next week, and I think the events there will give me some useful opportunities. I talked to a council officer about it all. Good. What does it involve? First, there's a dance show, which I'm sure I'll enjoy. The council explained that the concert hall's being renovated and won't be ready in time, so it's being held in the main square, which I think will be better anyway. At least I'll have more space to wander around in. True. And so I hope to be able to carefully watch the age groups that are there in the audience and make notes about how they interact. So that's one event. Then, the following day, there's another interesting event which I look forward to going along to, and that's a cookery competition. Oh, yes. Interesting. I think so. Yes, that one's being organised in the town hall, which has a big space, apparently. With food and cooking from all the different people in the area, the council officer told me that it'll be a good chance to find out about the different cultures that make up the community. Sounds promising. Then there's one more event I'd like to go along to. The council officer promised me that the courses fair will be interesting. It's going to be in the Langtree Theatre, and the officer said lots of teachers will be there. I've already talked to plenty of them, but he advised me to put some questions to the head of education, who will also be there. That's all very useful. OK, I suggest you come back. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning and welcome to this talk on Canada. Many people think of Canada as a land of ice and snow. They think of it as a young country with few inhabitants, a country of English-speaking white people. While some of this is true, it is also an inaccurate description of the country we call Canada. Canada lies in the northern half of the continent of North America. The most northern parts of Canada are sometimes called the land of the midnight sun because at certain times of the year the sun never sets and is still shining faintly at midnight. This northern part of Canada is cold and mostly snow-covered all year round. Most of the people who live in this northern part of Canada are called Inuit or Dene. They were once called Eskimos. They are the original people of this land and are part of what are called the First Nation. As we move to the more southern parts of Canada, the land changes and so does the people. Moving from east to west in southern Canada, we travel from the Atlantic provinces of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. These small provinces with small populations border on the Atlantic Ocean. The land in these provinces is not very fertile, so fishing, forestry and mining are the main industries, although in some small areas agriculture is also important. If we travel west from the Atlantic provinces, we come to central Canada, composed of the large provinces of Quebec and Ontario. Both provinces are rich in natural resources, have fertile land and are the centres of industry for Canada's largest cities. Toronto and Montreal are found in these provinces. The province of Quebec is the centre of French language and culture in Canada. In fact, Montreal is the second largest French-speaking city in the world after Paris. Finally, in the far west of Canada, we come to the province of British Columbia. This province is separated from the prairies by the Rocky Mountains and is bounded on the west by the Pacific Ocean. British Columbia is often called simply the West Coast. British Columbia is an attractive place for tourists because of its mild climate, spectacular mountains, sea coast and beautiful forests. Agriculture, forestry, shipping and fishing are major industries in British Columbia. The people of this land of Canada are as varied as its landscape. The original settlers, those we call the people of the First Nations, came from Asia by crossing the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska. In their new environment, they developed many new languages and cultures. In the 16th century, the first Europeans arrived in eastern Canada. They came from Britain and France. By making treaties with the original inhabitants, they gradually established colonies in eastern and central Canada. After a war with France, Britain took over the French colonies in Quebec and eastern Canada. By the end of the 18th century, all of Canada was under British rule. From this time until the present century, most of the immigrants to Canada were British, Scottish and Irish. In this century, however, Canada has had an influence of settlers from all over the world. There are now hundreds of thousands of people from Asia, Africa and South America who now call Canada their home. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.